It's kind of like uh, giving a little background. Recording is on. Um, giving a little background is, uh, so Palrick and I are working on this static site gener uh, generator called Plenty. And um, it uses Svelte uh, to build all the components on the front end. Um, and right now what we're doing is we're actually pulling uh, Svelte, like the whole JavaScript uh, runtime into um, a, a V8 environment. And we're actually compiling all those different components and then spinning on the page. Now, in order to do that with our project, we have to pull in uh, the V8 engine, which is written in C++, I believe. So you need a C binding for Go. And it has a lot of challenges in terms of like performance and portability for uh, exporting our binary to different environments like Windows and Mac and things like that. So we're just thinking through different possibilities to alleviate some of those headaches. Uh, and Powerx has been looking into um, actually parsing some, thing, some of the JavaScript uh, in Go natively using uh, a project called Antler. And uh, mm -hmm. I, he has some questions like, well, if we move some of these pro these steps out of the Svelte compiler into some of Go's native capabilities, there might be some advantages, but we're, we know it's a quite a big project, so we're not really sure exactly what's involved all the way down. So we, I think he had some questions just about um, some of those specific aspects. He, he's much better versed in it than I am. So like, I, I've been really <laughs> in, interested in stuff he's doing, but like, he, he talks to me about it. A lot, a lot of it goes over my head. So. Um, I, I figured that connecting you two might be the, the best course of action for um, for accomplishing this. Yeah, is my camera working? No, yes, because it's on here. Yeah, I see. You see, can you see it? Okay, yeah, no worries. I was wondering. Um, yeah, no. Obviously, I don't know if you're familiar with Antler. Um, no, not it's really. Has, I, I it's, heard it's, about it, but I don't really know. Yeah, it's 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 just a, it basically generates parsers for you, lex, lexers and parsers. You are you you give it the lexing grammar and it's and the parser grammar and it, and it basically creates a, a parser for you. And um, but I'm I'm trying to create an AST in Go using the, the Go runtime. Um, but I, I was looking at the the compiler, the TypeScript code, um, and just to try and get a better understanding of what you need to implement. I know like if you have if you encounter JavaScript, I presume you go after Acorn. So it's a specific. JavaScript parser you're using for that. You've not implemented anything. It's just any time you encounter JavaScript, you go here, Acorn take over. Is that the correct implementation? Yeah. And um, then for your own, um, the, like the mustache kind of syntax, you have your own parser for that integrated with a HTML parser, or do you have a parser specifically just for that grammar? No, for HTML, we implement ourselves. So it's I think it's fairly simple where you get because it's it's not really about the mustache, right? It's it's deeply embedded where the attribute itself has different kind of attributes, right? You have a code, it's uh you, you see the colon sign where there's like on binding, there's a use action, that, yeah. yeah, all of them are attributes, kind of attributes, but with a colon inside. So basically, when it's being passed, it's handled all of them through through the parser. Yeah, so it's just a super set of HTML then. But you you pass the HTML and all and, and all that concurrently with use with the parser you've implemented yourself. So if we were doing the same, we'd need to just um, kind of extend some even the standard Go HTML parser and just integrate your specific syntax that relates to the Svelte or the Mustache syntax, whatever you want to call it. So that that's basically what you need. So you need to implement a super set of HTML to include the specific spell side of it, and then just any JavaScript parser will do the rest of the work. Is there anything else I'm missing? Actually, I, I before we go like before we go deeper, like we probably we, we can step up, like take a step back first. Like what? I mean, yes, you will, you 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 are asking me about like how the parser is being implemented, right? So yeah, uh, maybe a step back is before we look about how it's being implemented. Like, what are you going to do with after the parsing, right? You get the Svelte AST, but then what's next? What do you do with that? Because I think for now, Svelte does not have a way to take in like a, a AST and then do the next step for it. it it's like go, it, it, it process the whole thing where parse and then compiles and, and generates code. It means like at one step, like one function, there's no way that you can take in AST into Svelte compiler. So, just curious, like what what's the next thing you are going to do with the spell AST? Yeah, well, that was the end goal is to just basically translate the compiler into Go, uh, because there's nothing. What's specific to JavaScript in terms of like it's a compiler? Like you're not running any any JavaScript, so that's all Svelte is doing. Am I missing something, or is Svelte like just basically taking in JavaScript and it's outputting a compiled version of it, but it's not running any JavaScript? It's not a runtime. It's not. It's not. Yeah, there's, um, no, there's no running of the code, but the yeah. But the comp the compilation itself has a lot of things down there, right? After you get the ASD, yeah. there's a lot of things happening. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, 
like the declarations and you do a, like a variable count and you see what's reactive and not reactive and then you do but basically that's just a template like you have your um for whatever you have you have some specific spell syntax or specific spell functions that, that they're there templates and if you encounter something you you create it like the the c is it cu for the mount the update the mm -hmm. destroy all that kind of stuff but that, that's just syntax like that's just something you put to the side like a template and you use that as a basis to compile the code so you can still do that in go you could have your ast and you could have your syntax specific to svelte and you could pull in those bits like there's nothing that it's happening in this file compiler that's specific to JavaScript that has to be done in JavaScript. Oh, Once no. you have, okay, no. No. yeah, I, yeah, not. Yeah. But you have like to do the yourself. If you yeah, that's to... yeah, yeah. I'm well, like it's a big, big undertaking. But at the end of the day, keeping this going with the V8 runtime, um, we can't use Windows at all because of the the binding, the, the, the requirements for the C plus plus requirements, and even as time goes on. Like, uh, Go is not designed to play well with C. Like it's not. They specifically don't re make any real effort because um, that's just the decision they made. Like, and there's a lot of overhead in the runtime of using C Go. So you kind of lose the benefit of having Go as the build system by having to call into the single-threaded runtime, which is like JavaScript is a single-threaded uh, language. So you don't. Go is the complete opposite. I have 12 CPUs there. I can use every core. I can use everything that I have. Yeah, so. If you, but the thing is, okay, I wouldn't say it's impossible. But for example, if you if you if you see ES build, it's trying to compile. If it it, it tries to transpile like JavaScript uh, using Go language, right? It does not have to yeah. be using JavaScript at all to do that. Uh, but yeah. but what they're doing is they're following uh what the the, the language they compile is following like the JavaScript syntax, uh, JavaScript like uh, specification. So. Uh, after a while, maybe after you catch up with maybe 2020, then every year incrementally you, you don't have much to catch up on, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but then for for Svelte, there there's no such thing as a specification, uh, and things you you probably will have to check like version by version every version like is there a new syntax yeah. features added in, and you would have to update your um, the compiler that you're writing to to catch up with all that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the, the thing I see is, if 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 you actually got this done, I know it's a big undertaking. But I think having to be, being able to compile it in Go, I think you get a lot of people contributing. It's just the, the stage is at now. It's very restricted because um, the runtime is is calling into C plus um, plus. Like yeah, we'll take a step back. There's a lot of overhead and there's a lot of drawbacks for you having to call into C and using the V8 runtime. Going forward, that's going to take a lot of maintaining as much as. Any changes in this file compiler? If you got to this, if you got to like the point where yes, we've implemented this file compiler for release X Y Z, there's still like, like just using Go alone with the V8 runtime. There's a lot of overhead there, and there's going to be more and more problems I see going forward. So no matter what way you go, there's always going to be a good bit of maintenance with each each time something new gets released in Svelte. So like either side of the coin, there's going to be overhead. But at least if you got a really fast compiler. Uh, where they compile concurrently, use Go the way it should be used, then I think you get a lot of people on board. So in terms of maintenance, you get a lot more contributors. But, uh, contributors. but I, I don't think as it stands, Jim can say whether I'm right or wrong, but there's quite a, there's quite a, it's not really open at the minute for contributions because it's, you kind of have to have a, a deeper understanding of how Go works. And like, if you start getting problems with the C Go runtime, it's a real headache. Like and it's, and you know, Jim will tell you the build system is complicated when, because of calling to C and C bindings and things break. But whereas if it was just standard Go, you'd open the avenue up to everybody to contribute because you, even if you only need a basic understanding, there's something you could contribute to. But as it stands right now, I think, no, this it's not as open as it could be. Like definitely if we had a compiler in Go, yes, each time something changed in Svelte, we'd have to update it, but that's, that's no different than at the minute. Something gets added to, to Svelte and it breaks the, the runtime. But at least if we have implemented, we can change it. We can't change the VA runtime. Like backticks breaks, breaks the VA runtime, which obviously is a problem when you're dealing with JavaScript. So like there's, there's what we're using now is not ideal in any way. And it's not really a long-term solution. There's always going to be major headaches. So as big and all of an undertaking as it is, if we could get to the stage where we've got a basic compiler working, um, it'd be trivial enough, I think, to update for any changes in Svelte. Like, I, like, I'm under no illusion that the initial thing and in implementing all of this in Go, uh, what you're doing in Svelte with TypeScript, but once you got to that point, I don't think the maintenance or worrying about new release things is going to be a major headache. Yeah, 
any more than what we're doing right now. If that makes sense. <laughs> the, the thing I would say is, yeah. So we're our, our project's weird, right? So it's uh, like we're, we're trying to we're trying to basically take like the, the JavaScript ecosystem. And we want to make it like a, a simple like static site generator, but still use all the power of Svelte, right? So we, we're doing something that's kind of strange to begin with. Um, I think you know the V8, uh, like the pulling everything into V8 was kind of like a step to get something similar to that working, but. Like Paul Rick said, like obviously, like so, like the M1 architecture, right? Like we can't release for that. We can't release for Windows. And like I feel like as more of these things come out, like it's more and more challenging for us to do that. Obviously, that's kind of a hole that we, we've sunk ourselves into. Um, and, and obviously, that still might be easier to get around than, than re like rebuilding aspects of Svelte, right? Because that's such a huge undertaking. Yeah, obviously, you and, and the other maintainers have been working for for years with with multiple people on it. So you know, I I, I realize that that's huge. Um, I, I think like getting an understanding of may maybe some of the, the bigger sticking points would help us like just understand uh the challenges in, in doing that like um like i don't know like if someone was looking at this from from like uh, you know a thousand feet up and, and we're looking at it for the first time like what what are the biggest challenges to implementing something like something like this you may implement like a spell compiler yeah like, like, language yeah Hmm. Actually, I don't really know. I feel like the the code base has been reflected a few times um, about how you would want to. A okay, so probably this is slightly on a higher level one, right? So the code base, I I feel like the code base has been uh, a lot of versions has been reflected maybe one or two times and maybe like less than like five times of big refactor where how we organize the code, right? Because you have, uh, you have one hand, you have a parser that parses the, the, the tree, then you have different kind of output targets, right? Uh, once is you can output for, you run on the client side and you can output code that runs on the server side, right? So in terms of representation, probably you have like a common intermediate representation of uh, you do like all the tracking and some of the stuff and uh, then you have you, you that there's like a few layers of intermediate representation of like the tree and then because of, and then based on different targets you generate different kind of outputs right so that would be uh, I think at, I, I may be wrong but probably the initial implementation was slightly easier than that uh, and also the initial implementation the thing, uh, the code that's generated is uh, using like string concatenation, and in the end, right now, it's it's using like it generates an AST in JavaScript and use and you and then serialize a JavaScript AST into JavaScript code, right? So there, there's like all these things happening. Um, let's see, and then beyond that will be, I guess, it's to figure out all the. Um, uh, it, I think. Yeah, and, and after that, we'll probably will be like, how well do you know about? I, I guess it, it will sound sounds to be like a compiler cell in your head kind of thing, where how, how how well do you know like what should be the output of the code, right? I, I guess the, uh, there there's no uh, it's there's no specification of how it should behave. It's more of like test cases of like when you see when you write certain things and this is what you expect, and the output code can be different across different versions where, where we are like, trying to optimize the output code or optimize in terms of the, the runtime behavior, right? That That is something that we we, we could have, we, we may tweak across versions to, you know, just to improve in terms of the runtime performance or uh, code size. Yeah, so there's, there's a multiple aspect, right? Could be code size, could be runtime performance and stuff. Right? So so the ultimate thing is that there, there's, a, there's a test suite uh, that test the runtime behavior, and those shouldn't break. Like even if you, if you, you know, uh, it, like your output could be like not using a C or M method or whatever update method. You, you could use something else, but as long as the uh, behavior does not change, where when you change something, when you click something, you should you should update the DOM. And that if that does not change, that, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So so there, I mean theoretically like someone looking to do this could implement like a small subset of what Svelte is doing, right? Like, like, like even if all the bells and whistles aren't there, as long as it, it can create, update, you know, mount and destroy, then it, like you could get something 
working in that kind of vein. Obviously, you'd have you know have to think about reactivity and all the other like um, bindings and things that you're doing. Um, but yeah, I'm curious. Like I get like you don't have to implement the whole spec to get something working. I would imagine. Yeah, at some point, I feel like probably you may not even need to call it spell, right? It could be spell syntax, but different output code. I mean, it's, mm. it's yeah, yeah. Very comfortable. Yeah. It could be just not spell. It's just like everyone writes the same language, but it could compile to a different code, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's the same idea where you could compile the same code for server side rendering and a client side rendering, and probably you can compile it to maybe for terminal and for you know like a different output. As long as it works as what you expect from writing the templates, and that 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 is yeah. Yeah, I saw yeah. The, the the HTML X like repo that Rich. I don't know if that's something that that you guys are still like like using as a, a spec, but like um, it was like I, th I think his idea there was like you, like there's a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. uh, frameworks that could use this kind of syntax, right? And you could just compile it in your own way. Um, so so that makes sense to me. Um, I don't know if that's still the thought there behind that. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea about that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been like ES3 is the same idea, I presume. You kind of have your interfaces and you all work off the same thing. It doesn't matter how you compile it once you you spit out something that has all these interfaces and you can use them interchangeably. I think that's the same idea with, with the Rich Harris's thing, yeah? It's, that's what ES3 is, so I see anyway. It's just, it's just a spec for, look, this is how you implement a parser. These are the interfaces you should have and these are the types. So um, I suppose, yeah, at the end of the day, a compiler is a compiler. Like there's different C compilers and C++ compilers. And I suppose it, once it does the same thing at the end of the day, it's just, it kind of doesn't really matter how you get there. I suppose just one may be more performant than the other. But I suppose once it essentially does from top to bottom what the other one does, it might be as pretty or as fast, but I suppose essentially that's just how you implement a compiler. So we could, uh, that's, that's kind of what I was, thinking about as well is more to get like, I know you have like things like create fragment and like it's reactivity really. And th that's the main part of Svelte. Like it's, it's you, you don't really care about other bits of JavaScript that doesn't do anything, that doesn't react. Like if you if you create a variable and it stays the same always, and that's not really a concern with Svelte. You can really, you just leave that as it is. It's just kind of, if you have anything that needs listeners that's reactive or that is specific to your syntax, that's what Svelte cares about essentially. And that's what gets compiled down to sp the specific type of Svelte code. Yeah, everything else gets it, not ignored, but it's just you leave as is. is. Is that correct in assuming? Mm, can you ref can you ref repeat that or rephrase that again? I don't really catch what you're trying to go for. Well, say, say if you have like let a equals one two three, and that that's it. Sir. It just doesn't change anywhere. All you really care about is is variable declarations that that are going to be reactive and change. Like you have to create listeners for and all that stuff. That's where you create fragments from. But like say like I said, if there's that variable a and it doesn't ever change that doesn't really you don't really care about that essentially then that's not part of that's not specific to svelte that can just be left as is and in the runtime javascript uses and whatever all you care about is reactive statements like reactive variables and things like that because like that's what svelte is all about you know like if something doesn't change you don't have any it doesn't you, you don't care about it essentially it's only stuff that's potentially going to change that you need to take care of and add listeners to and do whatever for i think they wrap uh, it in a validate yeah. right like yeah, I, I guess that's that's like one piece of Svelte. There's a lot of other things in Svelte as well. Um, for example, um, like the output code for transitions or say, how do you handle transitions? Yeah. For example, you, you need to take care of the elements where you play the transitions and then only when it's done, you, you remove that from the DOM and yeah, those kind of things happening. Um, yeah. And maybe another example would be a uh slots and components right so yeah imagine right now Svelte, uh, you 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 compile file by file right you only know one file and and, and yeah file by file then how do you know when you create a component but how do you pass the props or slots how how does that how does the data from one slot what one component pass into the slots and get into the other component and how do you uh, so, so you roughly know about how slots and components works, right? So you, yeah. you see that there will be like two components, and how does one uh, reactivity with one, within one component affects the other one? Because you you can you you can have a component here, and there's a slot component. You can pass data into that slot and to the elements, like elements with slot attribute. So how do you when you reactive over here? How do you affect that? Or reactive over here? You how do you affect that? So there there's yeah. other things as well, right? So it's not just like take care of. Uh, Reactive statements are there. There's like other, other, a lot of other small aspects of within a feature. 
Yeah, oh no, I get that. I wasn't saying it's trivial, I just meant it, but that's kind of, it, it is the reactivity side of things, and there's certain specific parts that is spell specific, and then other parts of JavaScript are just kind of left as is. Like, there, there is a specific, uh, like, it's a bigger, it's a, it's a subset of, of the JavaScript. You don't care about everything. You just have to understand exactly what you just explained, that there are, like, there yeah, obviously is glo global... It, yeah, if you put it the way where for all the... So, so you, you, if you put it the way where you have like HTML AST and JavaScript AST within a script tag, then yeah. the code that's written inside the script tag, most likely, yes, you only care about what is reactive or not, right? Yeah. Even in the JavaScript expressions, yes, you kind of like care about just what is, uh, with all the statements, what, what are, what is reactive and not, yeah. But beyond, yeah. beyond JavaScript, then as I say, like things like, Transitions and all that, right? Those are like things that you apply on the HTML, and yeah. you have to take care of all of things that is in the HTML as well. And yeah. Um, yeah, speaking of that, then also the style tag, right? That there's a style tag where all the CSS. Mm. So yeah. There is also a CSS part of it where how does it know like what elements it's going to be applied to? What are the CSS yeah. that is unused? Um, and how to mix yeah. things and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, put, put, put putting some random strings on and then find what, yeah, line up all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, what I meant is, I suppose, essentially, is that if you were creating a kind of a parser, like you can, I'm doing something with Antler, like, look at, I discovered Antler two weeks ago, so this is highly, highly likely that I have a lot to learn. But, um, like, there's specific parts, I'm creating a visitor, so this, like, why I was asking you, essentially, is that there's, there's a, a limited subset of actual JavaScript. Like, if we forget about all the other parts, but to say if we're just taking a JavaScript parser, there's a certain subset that you care about. So I can just create that visitor pattern for the expression, the assignments, or whatever we care about, and I could just kind of leave this other stuff as is. So if I was kind of creating my own parser, I could create a subset of everything. That's more what I was getting at, as opposed to, like, I don't need to visit every every single thing that's there, but just the things I care about, which would be reactive statements and very variable declarations and that kind of stuff. Is that correct? Like I don't have to see everything um, to just do the specific file well, parts. I, I'm not quite sure that I know. I, I'm not very sure about how Antlers visitor pattern works, but yeah. uh, JavaScript has. So, so you know that JavaScript has. Uh, what's that? Scoping. You know, scoping. Is it called scope? Yeah, scoping. Right. So you can shadow yeah. variables and stuff. Right. So yeah. if uh, if your if your visitor is like so called like stateless and stuff, then you may be seeing like expressions or update expressions that is within a function or maybe nested within a function, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, updating may not be a state variable, right? You need to know yeah. the scope well. Yeah, the scope, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the scope. So there, there's scoping that's, that's happening a yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, you, you kind of have to understand where it came from, whether it's a function or where, yeah, wherever it lives, you'd have to find the, the, the local scope for that. Yeah, I get yeah. That. yeah. So yeah, sounds easy. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. No, look, at it. Uh, this may never happen, but it, it was just in terms of the V8 runtime, and there was just so much work, and it was constant little things. That's things like backticks not being able to use uh, templates in JavaScript, like things like that. Is just is is painful, and you get you get these really weird bugs when we're using JavaScript for the imports. You might have it's a really messed up bugs that you're trying to figure out just because you're calling into the V8 runtime, and you're not there's certain things it just doesn't like, and it doesn't make sense in your own head. So it's just it made sense to at least attempt to look at creating a parser and trying to get something implemented in. Because worst case scenario, we can even do the stuff we do with imports to find import paths and to find the actual correct paths. So we could use the parser for that. There's lots of little parts of what we're doing now that we can still integrate anyway. So it's, it's regardless, it's a useful tool to have a JavaScript parser for us. But if we could compile it, uh, compile Svelte and Go better again. But like obviously, <laughs> that's a longer term plan. But just to kind of get some understanding of that, like from a higher level, what's like the essential parts that's just in terms of JavaScript. Um, like I know the HTML thing, that's another another battle for another day. But even if we just got the script tag and that logic working and understand, like like you said, the scope of things and uh, presume like you, you, you care about declarations and that fits into a big part of what Svelte is doing just in terms of the reactivity of the JavaScript part of um, in the script tag. Like if I could get that working first, we could maybe see how, how that goes and go from there. But regardless, like I said, we can use we can use the parser anyway in the build system as it is. But just look, I give it a go with whatever free time I have, and uh, if we can get something implemented, great. If not, it was worth a try. 
in Li Hao, the, the, like in when you're parsing JavaScript, you are like looking for things like the label syntax to actually like make it reactive, like reactive statements, right? So there is some pre-processing of the actual script tag, right? It's, you're not just doing a complete one-for-one -one capture of that information, right? Mm, what do you mean? So like, um, like a, like the the dollar colon syntax, like you're doing some kind of pre-processing on on that when you're when you're actually looking through the script tags, right? So it's not like you're just you're not just like copying like straight copying like uh, the information in the script tags and uh, compiling the HTML output, right? Like you're actually doing some pre-processing on that JavaScript code. No, um, I don't think so. That no, if you if you are writing vanilla JavaScript, then I mean the dollar colon syntax is is a valid vanilla JavaScript. Yeah. So, label statement, yeah. So yeah, it's a label statement. So there's nothing to. I'm not sure about what you are referring to at the pre-processing part, but basically that's we we take in we we, we parse it to a we pass it to a JavaScript parser to parse that to as a, a JavaScript AST for us, and we take that AST as a tree and we traverse it like we we, we visit all the nodes and figure out like where is the label statements and what what are the um, for example, label statement can be a statement or label um, assignments, right? So you, the, yeah. because it's a statement, you can write a normal statement itself, or you could write a declaration or assignments. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, not declaration, so assignments <laughs> or statements. Because so, a block statements, yeah. Yeah, so for assignments, then you know that uh, the what you're assigning to is depending on what is on the right side of the equation, equal sign, and yeah, and so you have to figure things out. So how to figure that is also through passing, going through the trees, right? Because it's, it's a label mm -hmm. statement, it's an AST, and you, you step down, you traverse down, you'll see that, oh, there's a label statement itself has maybe an assignment statement, and then assignment statements has um, like uh, the left side or the right side, right? And and what is the uh, operators? It could be equal sign, it could be a plus equals, it could be a, a minus equals it could be a lot of different kind of operator signs and we just look at them and we go through okay we go to the right side of the tree and figure oh there's like all different kinds of expressions we get like we keep traversing down and we probably end up with maybe a either a member expression which is like a member like a dot b or you end yeah. up with the identifier and that's where you realize that okay this is the variable that will affect this and we, we record that down right so you, 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 we will traverse through all the nodes and figure out like, okay, we see AST, uh, we see a label statement here, and then we keep going down and figure out, okay, all, these are all the dependencies, and these are all the uh, dependents, and there we decide, so, okay, now we will record that down, and at the end of going through all the three, like all the nodes within the JavaScript AST, now we know, okay, what is label, what, what is reactive, and what we should do next, like what kind of code we will generate next, yeah, and then we do it. Yeah. Okay. So you've, yeah, you've created listeners and then run them, obviously. You create listeners for whatever, and then when anything that changes inside that, that's related to that reactive statement, that code reruns or whatever, something like that. Uh, not really a listener. Um, so you probably can check, you probably can try to just write a few reactive statements and uh, look at a REPL and look at the output. Yeah, code. yeah. yeah, so yeah. Uh, it, that there's no uh, the the i the the high level concept is much easier than that. It will be just like one function that's like an update function. Uh, yeah. So this function will be you can ma you can imagine it's like um, I'm not sure whether I'm coding this right, but you can just think of it more of like an MVC kind of thing where anything okay. Uh, or you just imagine that there's one big function that will be executed every time something has changed. Right, and yeah. this this huge function is like there's a lot of if case if if statements for yeah. and each of the condition will be depending on uh so when you call this function you know like what has changed and true yeah. when when you're inside this function you have a lot of if statements where you check okay is this variable change is this state change is that state change and for within yeah. each of them if it's if that variable has changed then you should do something and then there, there's like if a lot of if statements yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, so there's multiple things, multiple parts that rely on it, and then it depends what specific small part has changed that you something happens. So you collect function. all of the things and put it into one. We collect all yeah, okay. the reactive declarations or statements into one. Yeah. We, we yeah, run through that every time when something has changed. 
Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, <laughs> somewhat better understanding. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, just to, to flag it, so I think um, we're running up against the, the end of the half hour block that, that we blocked off. I don't want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, uh, yeah, so pa Parik, did you have any last questions before, before we hop off? No, I'm just, yeah, I, I, that's, thanks very much. It's uh, definitely helped a lot to get a, a clearer understanding of how everything works and <laughs> to realize what a big job it is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah no, that, no, that was sweet. And uh, that's really all good for me. I hope everything's over good on your side of the world there. Um, I used to actually spend a good bit of time in Malaysia and Singapore, so I'm, I'm missing oh, the wow. food. I spent Penang, Penang, you're from Penang, yeah? Yeah, how do you know? Yeah. I spent, I was a year in Penang, I, I oh. lived in Ipoh, lived in Kuala Lumpur, I spent about three years in, in Malaysia altogether, yeah, so, okay. back in the day, yeah, mud crab, oh god, the food, charcoal, tiao and all that, yeah, we used to oh, be down there, every night, 10 o'clock dinner, loads of mud crab, <laughs> yeah, and I used to, used to love, the food is amazing there, like, the Penang is the best food, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah uh, do catch up if you have any questions, um, uh, I know it's a big undertaking and I feel like this is, this sounds impossible, like this uh, probably because uh, I, I guess this is more of like your work kind of project, right? So you yeah, probably have more yeah. time to contribute in, like, like more times to put in. Um, I do hope it succeeds because if it, if it works, like if you manage to write the whole thing and go, like re write the whole spell compiler and go like then um, I guess the performance will be like a few times like a few folds right ten folds or maybe more than that just like how yeah. it does for javascript bunching and transpiling right that's like how like the magnitude is a lot way faster yeah but the, yeah. To, to, to to manage to reach that point to manage to come up with a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you nearly need about 12 processors yourself yeah so yeah, yeah. so good luck with that yeah, <laughs> we'll need it. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate you hopping on the call. No, no yeah. worries. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Time for lunch. See you later. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>